Let me make one thing clear. I like Hilda. I think it's a good show and I would recommend it to just about anyone. In fact, I liked it enough to make a goddamn AMV about it, so none of y'all get to say that I'm hating on Hilda for no reason. That said, I've noticed that pretty much everyone talking about this show is treating it like the next Gravity Falls, and again, while I like Hilda, I do think there are some noteworthy attributes in this show that prevent it from being a masterpiece. I'm also going to preface this by saying that the point of this video is not to be an all-encompassing review of Hilda, and as such, I won't won't be primarily focusing on the many pros of this show. There are very few things I could compliment Hilda for that haven't already been brought up in other videos about it, so I'm just going to direct you to some that I largely agree with to save on time. Oh, and uh, spoilers, duh. One of the biggest disappointments I had with this show was how Hilda's relationship with her mother was handled. The first three episodes were by far the strongest part of the show for me, partly because they invoked an incredible sense of wonder and desire to explore the world of this show, but primarily because of how phenomenally Hilda and her mother, Johanna, were written. When the show begins, Hilda is completely satisfied with her and her mother's living situation because it allows her to go off exploring and adventuring in the forest whenever she wants. However, Johanna wants to move into the city Trollberg where she grew up because it's a safer environment than living in the woods. What I love so much about this conflict is that both parties are completely justified and sympathetic. It makes perfect sense that Hilda wouldn't want her life uprooted and we've seen how much fun she has exploring the forest, but it also makes perfect sense that Johanna would prioritize her daughter's safety above all else, and we've seen multiple times how dangerous their living situation can be. On top of this, the conflict between them is given depth from their dynamic as mother and daughter because neither of them wants to make the other unhappy, and they each sympathize with each other's motivations. This not only makes their relationship far more heartwarming, setting a precedent for what the tone of the series will be, but it gets the audience even more invested in the big question of the first two episodes. Will Hilda and her mother move to Trollberg? This is because either possible answer to that question is equally likely, and the outcome will have a huge effect on the show moving forward. And what's more, I love how they answered that question. Having the giant step on and destroy Hilda's house not only serves as an obvious parallel for how Hilda and her mom affect the elves, but it takes the agency away from Hilda and Johanna. They no longer have a choice but to move, which means that the core dynamic which has been set up between them, Hilda valuing adventure and Johanna valuing safety, is left unsolved, meaning that it will continue to be an aspect of the rest of the show. And in episode 3, that happened. Hilda is naturally upset with the new living situation, but her mother shows how the city can be just as exciting as the forest, and the show really sells this message. The way Johanna explains how each house is a different color and each mailbox has a different different design and stuff was wonderful, as was learning about the unique culture of this city and how they throw an annual festival for the Great Raven. The strongest moment that conveyed this for me was when Hilda and her mother rush to the roof of a building and look out onto the city, and it's beautiful, it's spectacular, it's breathtaking, and a bunch of other adjectives. When I watched those first two episodes, I was sad that Hilda and her mom were moving to Trollberg for the same reasons that Hilda was. The city didn't seem as interesting to me as all the creatures and landscapes that were present in the forest. And throughout episode 3, I continued to be in the same mindset as Hilda, and so when Johanna was revealing all of this stuff about the city to Hilda, it felt like she was talking to me. This single frame is the peak of Hilda's quality for me, because in a split second, everything Johanna had been saying fully hit me, and I knew it did the same thing to Hilda even before the camera cuts to her reaction. Suddenly, I became ecstatic at the prospect of continuing this show because this scene was telling me that everything I loved about the first two episodes would continue to be present and and it would be built off of this character relationship that I had grown extremely attached to. Wait just a moment, I hear the audience saying. I thought you said you were disappointed in how Hilda's relationship with her mom was handled, but it sounds like you loved it. What's the problem? The problem is we still have three-fourths of the season to get through. Starting with episode four, we get introduced to Frida and David, and from this point onward, Hilda and her mother's relationship becomes a side plot that goes almost nowhere. This would have been the biggest issue I took with the series had it not been for another plot point I'll talk about later on, partially because because I loved Hilda and Johanna's relationship so much and I wanted to see it further explored, but mostly because it undermines and contradicts what makes their relationship so compelling. Hilda wants to go adventuring, and Johanna is understandably concerned for Hilda's safety. The very nature of the show forced Hilda to encounter dangerous mythical beings and the like, and since we have established how Johanna would feel about this, she frequently is shown to be worried for Hilda's safety. However, because the show is constantly prioritizing the Hilda-David-Frida plot, it doesn't have 
time to progress Johanna's character. She simply expresses concern for Hilda, occasionally scolds her, and then lets her continue to go on dangerous adventures the next episode. The show is telling me that Johanna is worried about her daughter's safety, but her actions speak otherwise. I've seen some people point to this scene as a demonstration of how Johanna's voice actor captures the spirit of a concerned mother upset with her child for reckless behavior. Hilda. I know you meant well, but what were you thinking? And while I absolutely think that Daisy Haggard's voice acting is phenomenal and does indeed convincingly capture that energy, just look at what happens immediately after that clip ends. What were you thinking? I thought I'd found a way to give you guys a lucky break, that's all. <sighs> well, that's... That is very sweet. What? Johanna just does a complete 180 in her attitude towards Hilda's actions for no reason, despite the fact that Hilda just literally almost killed her and David. Because the show needs Johanna to reset by the end of the episode so that Hilda can continue to go on dangerous adventures. She knows that Hilda had good intentions, and Hilda's response to her mother's anger does nothing more than clarify the specifics of those good intentions, and this is good enough for Johanna to just be like, oh, okay, never mind, fam, you good. And this is before Hilda implies that she'll be more careful on adventures, which of course turns out to be total horseshit anyways. This moment is the worst offender in my opinion, but it is far from the only one. Johanna nearly constantly sees how much danger Hilda gets herself into and expresses concern, but she never takes action. And we know that she is more than willing to take drastic measures to keep Hilda safe because that's why she wanted to move to Trollberg in the first place, which is why it feels so uncomfortable for her to just reset to trusting relaxed mom mode after every monster of the week. When I was a kid and I unintentionally did something I wasn't supposed to, my parents didn't just say don't do that, they punished me appropriately so that the lesson would actually sink into my tiny skull. I truly believe that the reason Johanna's character gets pushed to the sidelines is because of a lack of time, which is the result of the show creators being more focused on Hilda, Frida, and David's relationship. And from what I've heard, the original graphic novels created by Luke Pearson actually didn't include nearly as much Frida and David content, which makes me very curious to read them, but unfortunately I can't find them anywhere. I guess hit me up in the comments if you know where to look. Regardless, it really is a shame that we see so little of Johanna because if you ask me, having her take action to prevent Hilda from adventuring and having the two of them come to a compromise fueled by their love for one another was the obvious and natural path for this story to take. I will say that I like the development they got in how Hilda lies to Johanna about getting a lot of scouting badges to make her mom proud, even though it wasn't really related to Hilda's adventuring. It's also just unfortunate that this means we don't get to hear Daisy Haggard's incredible voice acting very much since Johanna is easily the best voiced character in my opinion, and this is coming from from a show that has fantastic voice acting across the board. Hilda! Fucking chills. Now, I've been talking about how I don't think Johanna got much screen time because it was devoted to Hilda, David, and Frida, and although I think that Frida and David are considerably less compelling characters than Johanna, they are still enjoyable for the most part. But again, other people have already described the positive aspects of these two and their relationship with Hilda, so let's talk about the problems I have with each of them. And yeah, this is the segment where I talk about the one part of this show that most people seem to already agree is bad, but shocker shocker, I think I was bothered by it more than most people. I promise I like this show, guys. So in episode 9, the ghost that cleans Frida's room each night stops showing up, and the realization that Frida isn't super perfect causes her to have a bit of a breakdown. Now, this is a minor issue I have with this development in the plot, but I really didn't follow Frida making the logical leap from my room is messy to my life is a lie and I'm not the person I say I am. And this stems from how I interpreted David's arc in the previous episode. David's central progression throughout the show is in gaining self-confidence. He has skills, and he is clearly capable of a lot represented in the show through his singing ability, but he doesn't believe in himself instead relying on Frida to guide him through life, to an extent. In episode 8, Hilda decides to help David and her mother with their endeavors by casting a spell on them which improves their ability to do whatever it is the caster chooses. And while watching this episode, I was expecting it to go in the direction of Hilda unintentionally discouraging David once he realized that he was only able to do so well in his singing audition and the Sparrow Scouts concert because Hilda was helping him with magic. However, the episode does not go for this angle and instead seems to take the position that the events of episode 8 helped David realize his full potential and gain the confidence to sing and go on adventures and stick up for himself. Sort of like realizing that you've been taking a placebo pill for headaches, once you understand that the only thing that changed to make you feel better was your attitude, you realize that you don't need the pill. And I was fine with this, it may not have been what I was expecting from the story, but I was satisfied with David's thematic message and it didn't strain my suspension of disbelief. Unfortunately, because this new mindset was so 
fresh in my brain going into episode 9, I couldn't help but notice that Frida's development was in complete contrast to it. Frida comes to the understanding that a third party was helping her achieve some sort of goal just like David, but unlike him, she basically completely falls apart at the seams in response to this. Now, I do understand that Frida and David's situations were very different in each of their respective arcs, which is why this is only a minor issue to me. In fact, I'm sure some would argue that the whole point of Frida's arc was to contrast David's, and I completely understand that position, however the reality is that the narrative itself really doesn't draw any parallels between Frida and David's developments. As a result, any meaning that one might draw from this segment of the story is highly couched in speculation and will vary a lot depending on the viewer more than the other messages in the show. But despite the fact that my interpretation of these events isn't directly validated in the narrative, it is still my interpretation, and this resulted in some thematic dissonance during my viewing experience. Anyway, getting back to my primary criticism of the Hilda, Frida, and David plotline, and the most common criticism of this show as a whole, we must look at the rest of episode 9. This chapter of the story sees Frida splitting up with the group, and I found this to be easily the most contrived point in the show. Throughout episode 9, Frida and David act extremely out of character, getting into multiple fights over relatively minor spats. This not only made both of them much less likable, but it was very obvious that the writers were trying to drive a wedge between Frida and the others. It felt very inorganic and not well set up. Furthermore, Frida's relationship with Hilda also got kneecapped from this rush to create a conflict between them. At the end of episode 9, we learn that Frida is upset with Hilda for frankly nonsensical reasons. And honestly, I think that the best way to explain why I take such issue with this is to go line by line through Frida's explanations for why Hilda has been a bad friend and break down why they make no sense. Still our friend. Oh really? A friend to David who won't stop poking fun at me, and a friend to you who builds up my hopes for nothing! Like I established earlier, David poking fun at Frida came out of nowhere. As for Hilda building up Frida's hopes for nothing, I'm assuming this is in reference to Hilda reassuring Frida that she'll help fix the problem with her room throughout the episode. And while they end up not being able to solve the problem, this is not at all a fault on Hilda's part, and when she was encouraging Frida that they'd figure everything out, the group had no reason to think that that wasn't going to be the case. Thanks. You know, you're not making it easy to be your friend right now. You think it's easy being your friend? I don't drag people into dangerous situations just for the fun of it. This would actually be a fair point if not for the fact that this scene in episode 6 happened, wherein Hilda apologizes to David and Frida for exactly what Frida is accusing her of in their argument. And Frida explicitly states that she is okay with Hilda getting them into scary situations, even going as far as to say that that's what she likes about her. Frida has done a complete 180 on how she feels towards Hilda taking them on adventures for no reason. Sound familiar? Well, at least I know how to have fun. Right, because you're the cool wilderness girl, all free-spirited and everything. You think you're too good to play by the rules, just like the rest of us. This is really just a meaningless jab at Hilda. There's no reason we've been given to believe that Hilda thinks she's better than everyone else or thinks that she doesn't have to play by the same rules. I'd say the closest we get to this is Hilda being disruptive in class, but I feel like that was instead a demonstration of Hilda's lack of social skills and knowledge of city life etiquette. Still, this is definitely the kind of thing that a child would say when they're angry, so I'll let it slide. Hey, I wrestled a ghost for you. We all wrestled the ghost because you told me it would get my book back, but it didn't. It was just a horrible, terrifying thing we all had to do for no reason. Now this ties back to Hilda building up Frida's hopes for nothing, in that everything Frida is accusing Hilda of completely ignores Hilda's intentions, which is something that I felt the show had established was pretty important from the way that Hilda's mom was handled. Hilda didn't get them to wrestle the ghost for no reason, it was done with the explicit goal of getting Frida's book back, and Frida showed great appreciation for the effort Hilda was putting into this task earlier. What all of this means is that Frida would never act the way we see her act in this scene. This is not Frida, this is a massive plot contrivance that only exists to create conflict that will be resolved in the finale to make it feel more impactful. As a result, any time the show spends reminding me of how sad it is that Frida isn't around anymore, I don't feel sad, I feel frustrated because the show hasn't earned an emotional response out of me. And unfortunately, this wasn't the only reason the finale of the show somewhat fell flat for me. I really wasn't all about Tantu the Nissa, who 
the show spends a lot of time on, he feels very Monster of the Weeky, and I didn't find his story to be all that compelling. First of all, he's a completely new character. We learned that he was wrongfully kicked out of the house he was living in, but not much about his actual personality. And even the story about being framed for the wrecking of his old residence doesn't invoke much sympathy in the audience because its primary function in the narrative is not to make you feel bad for Tantu, but to set up the mystery of who framed him and why, if he is even telling the truth. And the fact that his honesty is called into question at all also makes him come across as less sympathetic. Still, I can definitely see how his inclusion was somewhat necessary as it allowed for the plotline of the Black Hound to exist, which I liked a lot, though I might just be biased because I have a dog. The way that the Black Hound is handled as this completely unknown and potentially dangerous entity really harkened back to the vibe I got from the first two episodes. And this actually leads into my next point because, unfortunately, I didn't feel this same energy was present for the majority of the show, at least not in the way I was hoping for. Remember how I said that episode 3 communicated to me and Hilda that the rest of the show would retain the same elements of exploration and wonder that I got from the previous two episodes? Yeah, well, the show kinda lied. Let me explain. See, the reason I love the forest setting was not just because it has trolls and elves and flying cats <laughs> It was because Hilda and her mom were surrounded by the unknown. In the forest, you don't have to go looking for wonder and magic. It often just falls right in front of you. And this was what I loved about the beginning of the show. But once we get to Trollberg, the series tends to focus on one type of paranormal creature per episode that doesn't really require the city setting to exist. And the species that I found to be the most engaging were the ones that didn't fit into this category. They were the ones whose existence and place in the story had an integral tie to the city and the people who lived in it. The Great Raven is something of a god to the people who live in Trollberg, so getting a story about him had the extra effect of expanding my understanding of the city's culture and making it seem like a setting more worth exploring. The Mara are these seemingly normal teenagers who somehow got possessed or corrupted or something which turned them into these nightmare spirits that get off on giving people bad dreams? And they just live among normal people in the city, completely undetected. That's super cool, and it's the kind of magical being that couldn't exist outside of Trollberg. But unfortunately, these examples are the outliers. Every other species we meet after episode 2, except debatably the ghosts and the Nyssa, are either complete departures from the city, or are injected into the city only to return to their natural habitat by the end of the episode. The city grounds the story, but this show appeals to me most when it isn't grounded, when there's this constant sense that you could look up at the mountains and see a... that thing. There's a reason I chose the song Catch and Release by Matt Simmons for that AMV I made about this show. Some of my favorite video games in recent memory are games which invoke that emotion. Breath of the Wild, Minecraft, Pikmin 3, Hollow Knight, they all place huge emphasis on exploration. Just charting into a complete blue ocean not knowing what you might find is one of the most captivating feelings for me and it was briefly present in Hilda. But that magic got noticeably dampened when the show chose to be about finding something new in a familiar setting rather than exploring an unfamiliar setting. Watch Arlo's video breaking down the exploration in Breath of the Wild and just replace the words shrines and Koroks with creatures and landscapes to get a better impression of how I felt watching episodes like The Hidden People, House in the Woods, and The Midnight Giant. I'm sure a lot of people who are off-put by this video are just thinking, well of course you didn't like this show as much as most people, you expected it to be something that it isn't. And that's entirely true. I expected Hilda to continue being like the first three episodes, and so I'm sure that when it deviated from what I was hoping for, I made have had a less positive reaction to it than someone who was just taking in whatever the show threw at them. But that doesn't make my opinion about the show or interpretation of the events that took place within it any less valuable just because they deviate from the norm. Personally, I enjoy analysis of media that doesn't try to look at art from an unbiased perspective because it feels more personal to me. But just like I'd never say that other types of analysis are worse, I'd never say that anyone who doesn't share my opinion on Hilda is wrong. And I just hope that anyone watching this video feels the same way. To close out, I like Hilda. I like it a lot, but most of the reasons I like it are the same reasons that everyone likes it, and more than anything, I want to bring new ideas to the conversations surrounding the shows I talk about. And the positive aspects of Hilda that got mentioned in this video were the ones that I feel haven't been represented yet. Nothing I've discussed in this video breaks this show, and furthermore, the positive attributes certainly weigh out the negative ones, which is why I'm so excited to see where this show might go in its second season. Fall 2020, baby!
Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, I'd appreciate it if you dropped a like. And I know I know it's been a month and a half since I posted an analysis of anything that people care about, but what can I say? I'll upload whatever I want. That said, if you want to see more of whatever I want, you can check out the channel and the stockpile of other videos I've posted. And if you want to keep up to date with my videos in the future, remember to hit the bell icon to get notified of activity on this channel. Have a wonderful day, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.